Hello and welcome to The Found Cause, where we found our cause and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I am Michael, the man behind the machine, and to my virtual front is... Sebastian, the bookkeeper. Welcome, Sebastian. Today is our last episode, the last in the series of the Islam series, this fourth in the Islam series. This episode is going to be a little strange because normally we have about one topic if it's myriadly focused, but this time we had a topic that was so small, we're actually going to add a bonus topic to the end of it. This is going to be on... Muslim end times, or eschatology, which is the study of the eschaton, which is in Greek for end times. We know that in Christianity, and we've done episodes on this in the past here in the Found Cause, and there's plenty of them like it, the Christian eschatology study is very varied and different, and people have different opinions, although there's a general consensus about a couple of things. One, that Jesus is coming again, that he will come to judge the world first, set up his kingdom, whatever that looks like, set up his kingdom for a thousand years, however long that a thousand years really is. Again, there's a lot of, a lot of varied interpretations here. But set up his kingdom for a thousand years, and then after that, there will be a final battle against Satan and his followers, and then it will be the judgment of the wicked and the dead, the resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous to either everlasting life or everlasting death. And then the heavens and the earth will be remade, heaven will come down to earth, or God's city will come down to earth, and then he will dwell with his people as he intended in the beginning and has things that are good. So that is the Christian eschatology, right? Basic, simple form. Sebastian, you've been doing a lot of research on this and fundamentally similar sounding is the Muslim eschatology, but it differs greatly based on what sect of Islam we're talking about, particularly between Sunnis and Shias. Do you want to go into that, Sebastian? Yes, yes. As just as wild as you know the the imagery the metaphors and the symbolism in revelation is likewise in islam there's also a very exciting turn of events near the end so both sects the sunni and the shias they differ and they throw a lot of insult to each other in their differences regarding uh, the interpretations of the end times so i'll get to that but first just as a very, very quick, quick rundown through what the end times are going to look like for Islam. So, at the very end, the the hadith are really the main source for the for eschatology in Islam because the Quran is not, you know, that explicit for what's going to happen then. There are brief, brief mentions of the end times, but and. And obviously more for the final judgment, but not so much what happens leading to that. So a lot of this is from Hadith. So, and I'm just doing a quick rundown. There's going to be many, many signs like Muslims drinking alcohol, like the Hadith being rejected, some random things like rivers being covered in gold. And in addition to that, there's going to be the Kaaba, the, ho the holiest building in in Mecca, it's going to be destroyed by a, quoting here from the Hadith, so you take, don't take my word for it, the Kaaba would be destroyed by a, an Abyssinian having two small legs. So. <laughs> uh, it makes you laugh every time. <laughs> so, <laughs> let, me, let me back up again before I start giggling too much. So, just like in Christianity, there is some birthing pains happening on the earth. So, in Christianity, there's birthing pains of, of things slowly getting worse until the return of Christ. Now, again, varying views on what that looks like exactly, but in any case, there are some signs, some wonders, some some signs of the times of wickedness increasing on the earth that is commonly accepted in Christianity as being a sign of that eschaton approaching. And so similarly in Islam, the different signs, there there's wickedness increasing both in the non-Muslim world and then in the Muslim world, there's wickedness increasing. It sounds like the impactful things are a little bit more noticeable, like the Kaaba being destroyed by a short guy from Ethiopia. Uh, that's interesting and is pretty noticeable, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I was, it, it does get me every time. I can't, I can't hold back. That's a very, very specific detail. So, you know, if you ever see an Abyssinian with very short legs, better watch out. <laughs> yeah, to guard your Kaaba. <laughs> yeah. Never let him into Mecca. So, there's going to be a clear sign of destruction. They also do interestingly mention that uh, Jerusalem will be rebuilt. You know, Israel will come back up. 
And now let's transition to the exciting stuff. This is, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of destruction, a lot of war. They also also mention of, you know, a battling the Muslims, battling the Roman Empire, which would have been Byzantium, you know, back in those days. So modern Muslims interpret the Roman Empire, meaning Europe nowadays, was going to be uh, ruled by some evil man, the Dajjal, the Antichrist. So we'll get we'll get more and more into that later. See, it's already starting to get very interesting. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so first things first. There's going to be a man named the Mahdi. So this Mahdi means the guided one. He is the one that is going to rule the Muslim world for a while until the Antichrist comes to conf- to confront him. So. Okay. So this is, this like is big, where big king. Huh? Yes, yes, exactly. Yes, so he's going the Sunnis. Here, here's where the the conflict arises. For the Sunnis, they think he's just going to be a a, a a caliph, a caliph, ruling the entirety of the Muslim world. Hence, why we have uh, movements, radical movements, that try to create uh, the Muslim state or uh, different terrorist organizations because they believe that Islam will be at some point united under one ruler, like as the way it was earlier during Muhammad's time. So now the Shias, though, they say they are called the Twelvers because they believe that the Mahdi is the twelfth Imam. Imam is, you know, the leader of the Shia community. So very much like a prophet, similar to a king, but more like a priest, king, an Imam. So the the Sunnis they think that the Mahdi is going to be a normal person born in near the end times. So he's going to be a normal human being. But the Shias, they believe that the Mahdi has been alive for over a thousand years, and he is hiding in secret well, somewhere. <laughs> so I, we should clearly state that the the way that Muslims and we're discerning their beliefs about the end times come from a mix of both the Quran, a bunch of hadiths, and then just tradition, interpretation, general consensus, right? S- similar in some ways to the Christian belief, except the Christian belief doesn't have hadiths, like we don't we don't get our interpretation of the end times from church fathers or anything like that, much more just from the Bible and tradition. The Quran has the um, hadith extras that Muslims take to it, but all this is very varied because of the interpretations. So you're hearing here that Sunnis believe in a king that's coming at the end, kind of similar to Jesus coming at the end, although different, and the Shias, the Twelvers in particular, which is a sect of Shia Islam, they believe that the Mahdi was and is the twelfth Imam of of Islam. However, that was a while ago, right? Like the eleventh Imam was in the eight hundreds AD. So the twelfth guy, like that, happened eons ago, well, twelve hundred years ago. So if he's the Mahdi, well, they missed their opportunity. You know, I'm smelling some Jehovah's Witness style missed prophecy, right? Like, oh, this is the one, this is the guy. And then he doesn't do it and nothing happens and nothing happens for 1200 years. So their defense of that, the Twelvers defense of that to keep their cult up has been that the man is wandering around for 1200 years. Yes. So I was also getting vibes, you know, from Mormonism saying that the, the Apostle John's also being roaming the <laughs> <Yes>. earth. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yes, they also, I mean, and I've, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm doing my best to portray the Shia belief as accurately as possible. So I'm using, as you know, Michael, I like reading in Arabic, as you know, as produ- you can question how productive that may be, but I do my best to, to quote from actual Muslims and from several websites from done by Islamic apologists and also just uh, imams, just religious leaders or just any educated person in Islam. There is a lot of heat being thrown at each other because the Sunnis, they do believe that the Shias are wicked because for they believe that the that uh, false messiah, the Dajjal, who's going to come after the Mahdi, is actually going to follow the laws of David and not rely on the Quran. And then the Shias believe that their Mahdi is going to follow the laws of the Bible, so like Deuteronomy, Numbers, Leviticus, all those laws. Mm-hmm. So God's law. Exactly. Yes. So they, <laughs> the, the the Sunnis actually say that the Shias 
MACD is, is actually the Antichrist. So you can imagine uh, the hatred that, the, the, that they have for each other. Hence why the modern state of Iran is you know, it's a theocracy, or you know, as close as they can try to make it a theocracy. And the purpose behind it is to pave the way for the Mahdi to eventually come over and take the reins of the Islamic community. So, you know, there is, there is a purpose to, to what they were doing over there. Now, the next character is going to be, going to be the Dajjal, the false messiah, the Antichrist. He's going to take, who's really, there's not that much information on exactly, you know, what he looks like. But what we do know is that he is going to try to wage a war against the Muslims, trying to exterminate, ex- exterminate them. He's going to promote more immorality across the, across the world, and he will claim to be God, similar to the Antichrist in Christianity, in Revelation. Well, and I know, you know, random fun facts, that this, uh, whatever you call him, Dajjal, uh, Dajjal, some traditions have him being a one-eyed man, where his right oh, eye is yes. blind, <laughs> yes. and deformed like a grape. <laughs> That's interesting. So there is some uh, there is some description of what he looks like. More description than the Antichrist of Christian tradition. Mm-hmm. Yes. So that was going to be the last one. So the last one will claim to be God and it's going to have some deformed eye. It's going to be blind. Also say that his mother is going to be a fat woman with long hands and the father is going to be a tall skinny man. We got some specificity uh, here. You were laying them off like you don't know what these people look like. We got the short-legged Abyssinian and this fat mother with the long hands. <laughs> like a guess character. <laughs> and with the with the there's been a I mentioned there were going to be thirty false messiahs. Did I or not yet? Not nah, you told me before. I don't think here. And this is in the Shia tradition, right? So the Shia tradition has some extras added to it, including this. Yes, exactly. Yes. So they are expecting they they were expecting that there have been thirty antichrists since the fo- <clears throat> since the since the time of after Muhammad. So the last one is going to claim to be God. So, and then who is going to come back and stop him? That's going to be Jesus. He's going to come down. He's going to descend on Damascus. I, don't, I really am not sure why Damascus, but he's going to go be, be, descend there. He's going to destroy. He's going to kill him. He's going to usher an age of peace after peace afterwards. But also, the, the you may be familiar with Gog and Magog. They also appear in the in the Hadith. So these are nations who are going to try to rise up against the Mahdi, and then they will be destroyed. And then afterwards, there's going to be a couple of other events on the Earth. Most significantly, there's going to be a change in the rising of the sun. And then afterwards, there are some traditions that claim that Jesus is going to settle down after you know all the enemies are defeated. He's going to marry somebody, have some kids, and then there's going to after that is going to be the time of judgment, in which a trumpet sounds similar to you know some, I'm getting some vibes from Revelation, and then from Yemen that's when the people will be gathered for the final judgment. And then we talked about how uh, salvation works in Islam in previous episodes so you're aware of those and then afterwards after the judgment when the good are separ- when the good muslims are separated from sinners that's when people will live in peace afterwards okay so let me summarize what we've said so far so the general muslim eschatology okay there's differences between shias and sunnis but the general one is that there is a coming king who will take over many nations and he'll be good he's the mahdi whether he's the 12th imam of the shia tradition and he's been living for 1200 years or if he's a future king that hasn't been born yet or maybe he's born now but hasn't taken over yet he is a good king that converts many to islam then Mm -hmm. in the midst of this mahdi ruling there is a final false messiah again whether whether he's in a series of 30 and he's the last one or he's just the 
the first of his kind, this Bijal, he's the false antichrist, he comes up and overcomes the Mahdi. In fact, he converts many to his side, but he is a bad boy. He his he preaches heaven, but that heaven is actually hell, and his hell is actually heaven. And he will convert many and be a great plague on the earth until he is stopped. So the Bijal is stopped by the return of Jesus, who we all know Jesus. Jesus comes back. He kills the Bijal and then sets up a, a sounding like a lot like a millennial kingdom. So if you're familiar with Christian eschatology, Jesus comes back, kills the Antichrist and his armies. And so much like this, I suppose. And then he sets up a kingdom that lasts for a thousand years. Again, depending on your Christian tradition, but I'm just going with mine. And that thousand year kingdom is attacked by Gog and Magog. So Muslims are, are piggybacking off of this. Gog and Magog both uh, are with Satan. They attack the kingdom of the Messiah and are destroyed. And similarly in Islam, these Gog and Magog come and attack the kingdom that Jesus has set up and the nations that Jesus has set up, except that he doesn't he doesn't establish a kingdom that's authoritative like Jesus does in Christian tradition. He just basically frees the world from the Dijal in this Muslim tradition. And then Gog Magog ravage the earth. They drink up all the water in the Sea of Galilee, um, which I guess is a reference to the Euphrates and the Tigris drying up in Christian tradition. I'm not really sure where they're getting that one, I guess, from a lot. And then they are destroyed, and there's finally a day of final judgment. Things are rearranged in the earth a little bit. There's like, like you said, the sun is changed from rising in the east to rising in the west, and the earth is re-leveled, like there's a different topography. And then finally, the dead are all resurrected and sifted out from the righteous and the non-righteous, and the righteous will go on to eternal life, and the unrighteous will go on to eternal damnation. Yes, you got everything except for one tiny detail. What? The random Abyssinian that destroys the Gala. <laughs> ah, gotta have it. Sorry, I forgot. One of the key pieces here is the little dwarf black man who comes in and pickaxes the Kaban. What's, so I think the most interesting thing about this is if you line them up against the Christian tradition, right? They they sound similar. Again, there's different details galore in, as far as the eschatologies go right like there's a lot of different details including the the short abyssinian man or the the way gog and magog interact and the way the jesus returns and all this right he comes into damascus and other weird things but the general things are similar to christianity except for one key difference they are staggered right if you notice in in the christian tradition there is no mahdi that's good there's only an antichrist who's bad and the antichrist comes and takes over a good majority of the world and people love him and he sets up a kingdom and then he's overthrown by jesus but in islam that same time there should be a good guy taking over the world and, and making people his followers so it's almost the exact opposite even though they're so close together it's the exact opposite christians most christians i should say are expecting a bad person, a bad ruler to take over a large portion of the world and influence many. And Muslims are expecting a good ruler to do the same thing. And so if we both were looking at the same person doing this, the Muslims might say, oh, that's the Mahdi, and then start following him. And Christians might say, oh, that's the Antichrist, and, and flee from him. So that's quite interesting, considering they are really close. It's almost like if, if we, of course, believe that Islam is not true, it's like the enemy set up for when God's predicted end times happen, that the followers of Islam will be followers of the Antichrist, thinking they're not. Right. And then what do you think would be, you know, some some steps to take in order to counter that or at least point out the mistake? Well, I think what should be stated and this is kind of a general one of the apologetics against Islam is that Christianity came 600 years earlier and some of the predictions from Christianity about the end times came earlier than that like in Daniel and and the like so when you look at the Christian eschatology clearly is it that Muslim eschatology is clearly based on it right a lot of similarities but the difference is this what I just said and some of the random details right and so if you look at the Christian eschatology and the Muslim believes that the general principles of Christianity, besides some of the details they believe are corrupted, are from God, right? They're the angel. 
particularly the Old Testament. I mean, look look at the predictions of the Old Testament about the coming of the Antichrist, about these kinds of things, and point out to the Muslim that, yes, there is an end times coming. There is a final judgment of the, of the wicked and the righteous. There is a Messiah coming and there is an Antichrist. But look who they really are. Look who was predicted prior. And look how the later Muslim scripture has perverted that, or even just Muslim tradition, because some of this isn't even from the Quran, it's just from the tradition and hadiths. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems you know, like a pretty like a pretty straightforward way of doing it. So it is something that's I mean, it's something that you really don't hear Muslims talk much about, at least Sunnis. I mean, I don't know if they're going crazy about this in Iran because you know they're a side note: There's at least at least three thousand people in jail in Iran because they've all been claiming, going around claiming to be the Mahdi. So oh, uh, three thousand. Yes, yes, throughout the country. So because you know, whoever is the actual Mahdi gets to own the entirety of the Muslim world, starting with Iran. So ah, uh, yeah, Iran is Shia. In case anybody's confused here. Yes, yeah, so you've got everything to gain. Like going around claiming to have been alive for well, except for the jail time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I think that's that's pretty much it, Sebastian. That's why we we made this a two parter episode. So we've talked about Muslim end times, just some basic facts, how it lines up against the real end times, the Christian end times, and how a little bit of the apologetics. Anything else on this topic before we switch? No. And actually, no, no. Take, I'll take, take my note back, actually, because whenever you discuss any topic regarding eschatology, even any theological issue, when you discuss it with someone, it is important to always bring it back to the gospel, because rather than focusing so much on the random details, as amusing as it can be, and from like the, the, the description of the parents, of the Antichrist or or whatnot, mm -hmm. or exactly what's going to be destroyed and whatnot. Rather than that, it is the end goal, the end game of this. It is the judgment. We talked about the judgment before of how it is. It is not the same as how uh, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, acts, how he judges, how he shows mercy, how he shows justice. It's very different in Islam. So... I think that actually focusing on the end game would be important. And then, obviously, if a person repents and puts their trust on Christ, correcting their views on the end times will come with time. Does that make sense? Yes, completely. So the eschatology issues are tertiary, even in Christian tradition. I mean, there's Christians who disagree with what I just laid out as far as how the end times work in Christianity. And we're still brothers and sisters in Christ because the core is that we are going to be judged and how are we going to be judged? And that is, do we, is our righteousness coming from ourselves or from Jesus? That's the only way to be judged. So that's, that's what the Muslim will face, the exact same thing. And the question should revert right back to how are you going to be declared righteous before God? So yeah, I mm -hmm. totally agree, Sebastian, that if you're talking about eschatology with somebody, a Muslim that you haven't talked with much before, I think the most important thing is to go right to the gospel, right? That both you and them agree that there will be a final judgment and that that final judgment will be from God and that will be to judge the wicked from the the righteous. But how is one declared righteous? Then you should immediately go to that none can be declared righteous, that you breach one part of the law, you've broken all the law, that they can't even keep their own Muslim commands, let alone God's actual law, and that there's only one to hide, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. So yeah, use this desire to know about the end times, use to you know this hype and turn it towards the gospel as you said, Michael. So that's that's great. Okay. So that is the end times. She and Sunni general, there's uh there's some books about it if you want to look them up. Of course, there's more on Wikipedia and whatever if you want to go into your own in-depth research. But as me and Sebastian were figuring out, there's a lot of confusion out there because there's a lot of confusion in the Christian Christian eschatology. And when people get excited, they start making crazy theories and Muslims are no exception. So there's not a great deal of unified information out there on the interwebs. So research at your own risk, but you can look more into it if you want to. The second half of this episode 
is dedicated to something that Sebastian in particular, but myself as well, have been storing up in a little baggie while we do this Islam series. And this is something we're calling the grab bag of Muhammad Fan, or maybe the embarrassing Muhammad moments, uh, like we did with the Pope. This is a collection of Muhammad stories that we felt like weren't particularly appropriate or necessary to talk about during the previous episodes, but now that we have time in the second half of this episode, they are too good to pass up. And I think not only are they more interesting than the short-legged Abyssinian man who destroys the Kaaba, they're also more important because they speak to who Muhammad was as a person. And he was truly God's one and only messenger, perfect from his inception kind of thing. Exactly. Couldn't have put it better myself. Just like how I had that secret stash of uh, popes doing crazy things at the Christmas party. Uh Uh-huh. To get the reference, be sure to check our video on the Pope. Great stuff right there. Great stuff. I was enjoy I was really enjoying myself in that episode. But but likewise how the character of a person can bring to question what they preach. You can apply the same criteria to Jesus as we're gonna do to Muhammad. So if the person is truly from God. This person should reflect the attributes and qualities of God. He shouldn't be some random hooligan doing strange things or... Uh, you'll, I'll, 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 I'll not spoil anything, so I'll just leave it at that. All right. Do you have anything to start with, Michael? Yeah, let's trade off. So I'll do one and then you do one. I've got three. I don't know how many you have, but Sebastian likes to tell me, send me videos, send me links to random embarrassing Muhammad moments whenever he gets them. So he may have more than three, um, but we'll, I'll focus on three for now myself. So we'll switch off a little bit. First one I want to talk about is one that starts off Muhammad's ministry. So if you remember history of Muhammad, he's a, a normal Arabic trader uh, on the, what is it, the west coast kind of of arabia if you the red sea coast that portion of arabia and he has a encounter with a spiritual being who tells him that he's gabriel and forces him to read but he can't read and then he starts reciting the quran which is supposedly from god right and then then he starts growing a small following in mecca well he's kicked out of mecca because they don't like him and they're probably theists and he's trying he's creating a little cult so he moves to Medina, and that's why those are two holy cities, one of the holiest cities, probably, I don't know if there's a list of the holy cities, but two, two holy cities in Islam are Mecca and Medina. So Muhammad really grows his followers in Medina and takes over Medina, and Mecca's still a big hub, a big trade hub, and he's got kind of an axe to grind against the leader, and one of the biggest tribes of Mecca is a leader named Koresh, or Karash, I don't know how you'd say that, Sebastian. Do you know him? Quraysh? Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> that, yeah, that man, Quraysh, um, is the leader of Mecca. And him and Muhammad sign a 10-year truce called the Treaty of Hudabiyya. Okay. Sign a truce, it's 10 years. In, in the meantime, during this truce time, Muhammad is gathering more followers and getting some whole tribes to join his movement. Because now he's got, a, he's got a city, he's got a following base, some whole tribes are converting to Islam just to get in on the good. So... He converts a couple of tribes, and one of these tribes happens to break this treaty. He happens to murder a tribe affiliated with Horaish, or the leader of the Meccans. And so the tribal leader that did this, he broke the truce, goes to Muhammad and says, Hey, just so you know, I killed a bunch of our supposed truce people. You should get ready for war. So Muhammad says... All right, sounds good. And even though there is a truce, because it has been broken by one of Muhammad's own tribe leaders, Muhammad gets his army and surrounds the city of Mecca. Well, of course, the Meccans weren't prepared for this at all, and they still think they have a truce on. So Quraysh, whatever you want to say his name, he comes out to Muhammad and sends a delegation to him saying, hey, is the truce still on? We still have a treaty, don't we? And maybe I can pay you to keep the treaty on, you know, because I see you're surrounding my army, or my city with your army. And... Muhammad disregards this delegation and instead invades Mecca, capturing it, breaking the truce, and the Meccans didn't have any time to gather any soldiers. So that is the first major conquest of Muhammad, is using a a broken treaty. He breaks the treaty indirectly and then super breaks it when he, you know, kills all the people in Mecca. Yeah, so using deceit to take over the, the city. 
essentially. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Okay. And cer- certainly not mercy, that's for sure. Right, right. Now, so We do have to admit that mercy against the wicked is not always not a necessary extension, right? But the deal here is that they didn't breach the treaty, right? The Meccans didn't breach the 10-year truce. It was Muhammad's own side. So if Muhammad was really going to have a right to say that the treaty was null and void, it should have been from the Meccans attacking his side, not his own side breaching the treaty and then using that as an excuse. So it is really just deceit. Right, right. And something that just came to mind when you said that, Michael, actually in the Old Testament, when the Israelites are coming to the Promised Land, the Canaan, mm-hmm. they're actually, while well, they're, you know, taking over the Canaan tribes left and right, there are there's either one or two that pretend to be from a faraway land mm-hmm. and they signed a treaty without the, I mean, with the Israelites, and then obviously they don't know they're nearby. So, and then even though they were meant to be conquered, the Israelites honored those, that treaty with those, with those people that they signed it. So even though they know that was by their right to take over the land. So a, a different contrast between the two situations. Yeah, and God warned the Israelites not to be making treaties like that, but they decided to anyways, and it turns out it was a trick, and they're still they're right there next to the Israelites, right in the land that they were promised. But you're you're right, they do. They honor the treaty, and that's why God says don't write treaties. Otherwise, God would say, yeah, write as many treaties as you want, because you can always break them if they're not good. Um, instead, God says don't write treaties because you have to honor them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's a nice contrast there, and now there is... I want to start with a well-known one, one of uh, Muhammad's wives. And actually, she's very prominent in Hadith. A lot of narrations come from her, and it's the one and only, it's Aisha. So, Aisha, one of Muhammad's favorite wives, she was a child when Muhammad married her. She was six years of age. There's a lot of heat with Muslims in the sense that they say that now she was actually older, and then that this is you know just a miscalculation but no, 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 that's not that's not true at all from Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim Aisha narrated that the prophet married her when she was six years old and he consummated her in marriage when she was nine years old then she remained with him for nine years until his death another Khadija died three years before the prophet Departed to Medina. He stayed there for two years, and so then he married Aisha when she was a girl of six years of age, and he consummated the marriage when she was nine years old. And if there's any confusion there, they got officially married at six years old, which is, I, I suppose it's like a betrothal, except this is official marriage, and then consummation means having sex. So they had sex at nine, which is early even in that time. It was not an acceptable time to have sex. That's why it was so noteworthy, even in the Hadith. Yes, yes. And that is... There are also other passages, you know, citing to his strange desire to be with the little kids. For example, in, in Sahih Muslim, Muhammad asked one of his friends, why didn't you marry a young girl so that you could play with her and she could play with you or you could amuse her and she could amuse with you rather than an older woman so this in in modern terms we classified as pedophile and not very good and also she was his favorite wife wives and speaking of wives he had many wives and he would sleep around with them on a trying you know he says trying to be equal with them but then he clearly did not treat them equally because he had a group of favorites and then a group of eh, like the others you know that how how you, how you say it michael the harem. the one that, the yes the harem yes the ones who got the less attention so yeah i mean and that's just a feature i have to say of plurality in marriage of, of um, polygamy because of course you're going to have a favorite of the, the however many wives you're allowed Islam allows four and so Muhammad had four depending on how you count he but, had nine wives yeah, yeah. <laughs> depends on how you count right I think some Islam people in Islam would say that he only had four official ones at any one time 
but yes, he had nine in his life, and then he also had other. You know, he had sex with others that weren't his wife. Yep, and as another case in which he got his way with women because he was known as a womanizer by narrated by Altabari. So this is the parents of a girl that was falling for Muhammad. This is this is what the parents said. You're a self-respecting girl, but the prophet is a womanizer. So and then they tried to really stop her from chasing after Muhammad because they knew that Muhammad had arranged for the marriage of his between his adopted son and his wife. So he Said was just a newly adopted son of Muhammad, and Zainab was the, uh, the son's wife. So one day, Muhammad sees her topless, and then suddenly, uh, a day or so later, he gets a revelation from Allah saying that his son should turn over his wife to him. And so he d- and so he did. Which uh, is a classic move. I mean, Joseph Smith did the same thing. Desired to see yes. his wife, had a revelation, got the wife. Yes, and as Aisha narrated in Sahih Bukhari, I feel that your Lord hastens in fulfilling your wishes and desires. Yep, indeed. Now, it should be noted that, again, in Islam, marriage to somebody who is not your wife, or who... Marriage to an already married woman is still considered adultery. So this is a special exception given to Muhammad. Yep. And then he also, as a side note too, he also unadopted his son afterwards. So it wasn't a happy ending. Yeah, well, I'd imagine. Okay, so there's some of his marriage life. Let me give you another fancy Muhammad story. This one related is about how Muhammad taught his followers and how they did in general treat prisoners of war so prisoners of war even in the um, jewish tradition and and sources they or i should shouldn't say that in god's law he allows for particular times to take prisoners of war and prisoners of war are exclusively either manual labor men or the if the men were all killed for because there's particular times when the men are all to be killed if they're in canaan uh the just the women and children, okay? And the women, if they if their husbands have died or if they're unmarried, they can be taken as wives. However, there's a strict stipulation in how you do it, really to discourage Jewish men from taking these women as wives. Um, you have to have them shave their head, keep them for a month without having sex with them, and then if you do and you're displeased with them, you have to give them a large sum of money and let them go and... Um, not keep them as some hated wife and not consider them an adulterer or something like that. Okay. So that is in the Jewish tradition. I know that doesn't jive with much of what we think about today. So I'm, I'm, I'm being transparent here so that you know that there's there's uncomfortable things about God's law as far as prisoners of war and marriage go. However, let's compare that to the practice and law that Muhammad gave and his followers did. Here's an example from the... One of the hadiths. This is from Sahih Muslim, which is a very respected hadith. Volume 2, number 3432, in case you want to look it up. Abu Sayyid al-Qadri reported that at the Battle of Hunayn, Allah's messenger sent an army to Autus and encountered the enemy and fought with them. Having overcome them and taken them as captives, the companions of Allah's messengers seemed to refrain from having intercourse with captive women because of their husbands being thought polytheists. Okay, pause. Normally, they would have sex with captive women, okay, not marrying them, even though those women were married and still married. Their husbands were actually captured as slaves. Their husbands were not dead. And the Muslims, followers of Muhammad, right there with the Prophet, they would have sex with married women. Okay, But in this case, they were hesitant because the husbands were polytheists. They weren't, uh, they weren't people of the book, right? They weren't Jews or Christians. So let me continue with the hadith. Then Allah, Most High, sent down regarding that, quote-unquote, and woman already married, except those whom your right hand possess are forbidden from sexual intercourse. So 
again, the Quran has that that adultery is the common definition of adultery, that women already married, having sex with them is adultery. However, in this case, and after this specific incident, when there were a bunch of captive women that that the companions of Allah wanted to have, uh, companions of Muhammad wanted to have sex with, but didn't want to, they weren't sure if it was right because they were already married, Allah, or through Muhammad, of course, sent down that this is an exception, that if you if your right hand possesses them, if you capture them in war, is what that means, that you're allowed to have sex with them. It's actually a temporary marriage. So you temporarily get married to an already married woman, and then you can drop them. Like, you know, a used piece of cheese. So, very different than God's law. And I know that God's law upsets a lot of people, but this is far worse, in my humble opinion, that if it's not Allah giving it, it's just Muhammad, right? He brings down a fake message from Allah saying, oh, yeah, yeah, except in this case, you can you can commit adultery. And then all his followers do. In fact, there is another tradition, I don't have the quote here, that says that Muhammad's followers were asking him, they said, oh, you know, uh, we just really, we really are missing our wives. We really want to do it. But we can't, we can't lawfully have sex with these women that we've just captured. Um, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to cut off our manhood? And Muhammad's like, mm, no, no, no. <laughs> I wouldn't have you guys do that. I mean, that's the logical next thing you do when you're, when you're raring to go. Uh, let me get a message from Allah. And then he does. And they, they have sex with the women. So I think it's pretty distasteful. And that's putting it mildly. Yes. Oh, man, man. Yeah. So that is Muhammad at his, at his worst. But, but I do have a great picture. And this will actually be a very, very strange picture. So maybe, maybe don't, don't imagine that analogy. But Muhammad did cross-dress during his life. Interesting. Yes, yes. Let me go on. So this was when people would approach him and also his wives complaining to him so then they encounter him Muhammad said do not annoy me regarding Aisha so pause this was because you know they were giving him presents and then he was also you know he also wanted Aisha to get presents as well so the, the wives were coming to him and protesting. So Muhammad says, Do not annoy me, very Aisha, for inspiration has not come to me when I was in any woman's garment but Aisha. So they walked in on him when he was wearing women's garment. That is from Bukhari. So it's a, that is a another hadith. Another one from Bukhari. It is oh, Musalama, do not hurt me with Aisha, for by Allah the inspiration did not descend on me while I was in the covering of any of you except Aisha. Like the covering would be the <laughs> the, the clothes, like the the dress. Okay, know? so does that mean that he was he was dressing in all their clothes, and then Aisha was the only one that worked, and that's the excuse that she should keep getting more clothes? Yes. Yep. Yep. He tried all nine, and then no, Aisha is the one. Or he was trick, man. And it should be noted that in God's law, cross-dressing intentionally like that is punishable by death. Yes. And, and wow, equally, Michael. Even in, even in uh, most Sharia law countries like in uh, Indonesia, I can think of there's portions of Indonesia where they do put you to death. At least they cane you for cross-dressing. Yes. Yeah, so these people are very, over there in Indonesia, they're very disrespectful. They would probably stone Muhammad to death because of he needed to wear women's robes in order, Aisha, excuse me, Aisha's robes in order to get revelation. And I was actually going to quote the, the law from Deuteronomy. It's from Deuteronomy 22. A woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing. For the Lord, Yahweh, for Yahweh, your God, detests anyone who does this. Yes. Clear breach of the law. Not that you needed to know, because he's breaching law in lots of places, but there's another one. Yes. In a very strange fashion pun intended yes and my last one is just a total grab bag one and this one i don't have a a source on hand so forgive me but it's also known that muhammad had an incident where he was sitting around with with the fellows inside and one of their sons came around and saying that he was thirsty and so muhammad then took him and spit into his mouth with his tongue 
oh yeah yeah and then the reasoning behind this was because any like whoever is touched with the prophet's lips will not taste hellfire yeah yep so just a little make out sesh with the kid you can see why we kept this section for the end of our islam series because it's not quite as serious and i'm sure many muslims would debate the validity of some of these stories and it doesn't help that the stories about muhammad are spread across many different hadiths but you can see we're trying to quote what we can the ones that come from totally reputable hadiths so the i don't have a quote for this one but the ones about um, how they were marrying um, like aisha's marriage and then the stealing of his adopted son's wife and then the uh, war captives and his conquest of mecca those are all completely reputable i don't think that any self-respecting muslim would deny those they might deny this this boy kissing one and maybe the cross-dressing one although the cross-dressing one comes from uh, reputable hadith in any case multiple cases yes from multiple and several times from sahih bukhari and then from sahih muslim as well so yes and also aisha narrated so it is very likely that it did happen nonetheless i have a last one all right and i saved the best for last that one time when he was poisoned by a jewish woman in kaibar it is also from Sahih Bukhari. And so for the story, you know, after taking over that town in Kaibar and also killing the men, so they, this would, they would have killed the, the husband of this Jewish woman, Muhammad has the bright idea to ask her to cook a meal uh, for, for him and his friends. So this Jewish lady, she prepares some nice lamb, some sheep, but she poisoned it. As so then she says, yes. <laughs> just all our family. Yes, considering her family was just exterminated and then she was taken as property by this man, you, the most sensible thing to do would probably to to poison him, as she did. And then, and then what happened was that one of the companions of Muhammad tastes the food, and then he dies, and I guess in dead, death. And then Muhammad also ate part of the food but somehow managed to live. And then here's what Naisha, Aisha narrates. Oh, Aisha, I still feel the pain caused by the food I ate at Kaiba. And this time, I feel as my order is being cut from that poison. So years, this is years later after the fact, Muhammad was still agonizing from this because probably burned his inside like in bleach. So not, not, not a very pleasant experience. So that, But when, back to the story, though. They bring him the jewish woman and then he asked like what what motivated you to do this she said if you were a prophet this would not have harmed you but if you were a king or a tyrant i should rid the people of you then the apostle of allah ordered that she should be killed and then later she's still complaining from in abu Daoud in abu Daoud. i continued to feel pain from the morsel which i had eaten at kaibar this is the time when I was cut. This is this is the time when it has cut off my aorta. Side note: Muhammad did speak about in several hadith that if a false prophet or someone who testifies falsely will have his aorta cut by Allah, and ironically, he's saying that his aorta feels like it's being slit. Anyway, back back to the back to the to the embarrassing Christmas party. So, when <laughs> it was must have been for the Jewish woman, but before she was executed, but and for the, the there's a reason why she did this, and it's very interesting. I didn't, I didn't notice before, but then comparing it to the story of Elisha in the book of Second Kings, there is an event in which some guy goes out to the woods and brings ingredients, doesn't realize that one of the herbs and plants that he gathers is actually poisoned, and then eventually the the food is being poured and then they yell, don't eat this. There's death in the poison. It's dangerous. Do not eat it. And then Elisha says, get some flour. He puts it into the pot and then says, serve it to the people to eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. So that was the inspiration that the Jewish woman probably got from the, from the Old Testament. Clearly did not play out as a Muhammad was expecting. But Muhammad did give a reason 
saying, you know, he ate the food just to show how the how there was poison in it. So <laughs> what? Well, he and he eventually does die from this complication. Yes, yeah, it's probably like eating bleach. It was most his friend died there too, so it's actually surprising that he lived through this. That's why he was he lived for four more years and agonized for the rest of his days after after that after that. So yeah, it did not. It was not a pleasant experience at all. Well, I have to say, a lot like God to have a woman take out somebody like that, as he did in the Old Testament too. And I have to agree, second it. Well, Sebastian, any other fun Muhammad stories, or is that it? No, oh, that was it. That's the best one. Ah, yes, yes. Before I forget, a big shout out to David Wood, his channel, and also the channel of Islam Critiqued. They have been a great source to summarize all of this information. I also gave particular shout outs to several sources that I cited for, especially for the salvation, Muslim sources, and also to discovering Islam, a nice website that had you know, the, the summary of the Mahdi and the false messiah. So big shout out to them for assisting in producing this podcast. Yes, for sure. Because yeah, considering most of the, all the original sources are in Arabic and though Sebastian is trying, it doesn't read Arabic and I certainly don't. So we need somebody to uh, help us and get, it's a, a blooming industry to, to do things in English in the Muslim world so it is a big help when places like Discovering Islam or David Wood or other ministries have translated and compiled these kind of facts for us all right well thank you all for listening to our Islam series again this is the last of a four-part series so if you want to see the rest of them you can see our three previous episodes on more serious topics than this one again this was a eschatology and then grab bag on Muhammad stories last ditch we just wanted to say some of these things because we discovered them as we had been studying islam so thank you for listening this has been the found cause where we found our cause and serve the lord jesus christ i am michael the man behind the machine and to my virtual front has been sebastian the bookkeeper thank you for listening if you want to see the rest of our episodes you can go to foundcause.pinebead.com and download them all for your listening pleasure or you can ask your amazon echo you can go to itunes you can find us on spotify you can find us on youtube or facebook.com forward slash found cause and check out all of our videos there for your listening pleasure we put out one every week and until next time thanks for listening bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.